to see Paddy Mills not just get the medal, but the way he got it and the way he built that team and the culture he put in that team and the amount of himself that he invested in that team. Yeah, you know, that was just a great story. You know, right down to, you know, traveling to two games, you know, they'd be cranking up the Aussie tunes. They only ever, when they were together, they only ever played Aussie music on the bus. And that could have been Slim Dusty's, um, you know, I'd love to have a beer with Duncan, or it could have been Down Under Men at Work or In Excess or whatever. But, you know, they just built this culture in that team. And someone said to me the other day, hey, but hang on, it's only a bronze medal. And I said, wow, it's an Olympic medal. Well, what an absolute pleasure it is to have a man who's been in the media for over 30 years. He's a 10-time Australian water ski champion. You see him on the screens of Channel 7 doing a wonderful job as a sports presenter on Sunrise. And now he's an author. He's got a new book out called Mark, called Mark Beretta's Greatest Moments in Australian Sport. It goes back to the year 2000, so plenty of moments to talk about. Mark Beretta, great to have you on the show. Oh, Bevo, thanks for, thanks for joining us and thanks for showing off that beautiful book, man. <laughs> no, it's an absolute ripper. I've, I've had a look and uh, there's some great moments in there. I'll talk about a couple of mine favourites in a minute. But uh, tell us about the yeah. idea, how it all came about. Well, I, things were a bit quiet at COVID time, so it was probably a bit bounced around. Then I, I, I had a lot of spare time and I, I sat around and I started a list and I, I probably wanted to do it for a while and just you know, what were, or to try and rank the, the greatest moments in Australian sport from, and I drew a line at 2000, I, I didn't go back beyond there, which it just got too hard and too big. But I came up with probably about 60 different moments. And uh, then the, the challenge was uh, to try and cut it down to 20. And then even harder was to try and rank them. So it was a labor of love. I really, really enjoyed it. And then going back and talking to the athletes was really special. Like I caught up with Adam Scott on the he was on the practice range hitting balls in Dubai um, the day before a tournament. Jonathan Thurst from the Cowboys, I caught up with him uh, while he was on family holidays. I got Emma McKeon, the swimmer just back from Tokyo. She was locked down in Darwin in that quarantine center. So um, you know, she was up for a chat, so that was good. <laughs> but and, and Lounsey, I talked to Craig Lowndes. We just sat down on a couple of boxes out the back of Pit Lane at a supercars round and, and had a chat, and which was funny because it spoke about his time in 2006 when he, he won the first of three Bathurst in, Bathurst in a row with Jamie Winkup. And it was just after, in 2006, just after Peter Brock had passed away in that accident in WA. And, and they'd asked Craig, you know, they had a special service before Bathurst. And then they asked Craig to drive a Brocky's old Tirana around the mountain. And then he had to jump in the car to, to start the race. And he came out of the Tirana and he was just a wreck. You know, I don't, I don't think there was a dry eye on the mountain that day. Lounsey was hugely emotional. And Roland Dane said to him, hey, listen, mate, you know, I don't think you should get in the car and drive this first stint. And, and Lounsey said, I've, I've got to do this. And so he ended up doing it and they ended up winning. He won the first Peter Brock trophy with Jamie Winkup. To talk about that with, with Lounsey, he became very emotional. And, of course, I, I worked with a known Brocky for a long time. We, we were both sitting on these boxes out the back of the pits and we, we were both being a bit emotional and it was... For people walking by, it was pretty weird. I think <laughs> two blokes were sitting there just having a bit of a tear rolling down the cheek. So, yeah, it was a great, it was a great experience. Yeah, phenomenal. And like you said, amazing that you got to, to chat to all these incredible athletes and, and reminisce mm -hmm. over, over all the time going back to 2000. 20, mm -hmm. though, because like you mentioned, there's just so many moments. How do you make it, yeah. you know, 20? How, did you have a bit of a criteria where you chose, chose those 20? Because it, yeah. it would have been so difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Then the criteria was how it moved the nation, you know, how people responded, what it, what it meant to Australians as a, as a group, um, how we celebrated the moment. So I tried to look for the really big moments that the whole nation just went, wow, you know, and, and appreciated. And we're lucky we live in a country that loves its sport. So, you know, you really get a, it's easy to get a barometer of a big occasion because it's the way we react. So that was probably the criteria. It was it was really hard, to be honest. To trim the list to 20 was hard, and then to try and rank them. Like, I'd wake up in the middle of the night, I'd keep the list by my bed, and, and it's, I must show it to you, it's full of scribbles. Like, I'd, I'd cross <laughs> things out and move things up and down the list and and, and take things off the 20 and, and readjust them. And it was, it was a great experience. And I, I bounced off a lot of people. Like, I, I turned to a lot of people, you know, who I, I know and respect, including Bruce McEvaney and, and a lot of people I've worked with in sport over the years, just have a look at the list and, you know, see what they thought. So, look, no one will agree on the same list. No two people ever will because it's hard to be really, truly objective. You know, you'll always be uh, probably a bit flavoured by your, your emotion and, and what it meant to you and whether you were at the, the event or whether you're watching it live at the time. So I think everybody's list just differs a little bit, and I love that. You know, I've, I've had so many debates with people already, and it's early days, 
just about what the what the order should be, what should be in, what should be out. And and you know, everyone has a has a different read on it. And I think that's fantastic. The main thing for me is that people talk about these moments, you know, people experience these moments again. And and I've been through this process now, not only doing the book, but but through this talking about the book and the number of times I've, you know, I've relived the moments on video, but every time I still get the goosebumps. Often I'll get a little a wet eye. And okay. um, yeah, you know, it just and, and even people I talk to, and, and hopefully, Bevo, you're feeling the same now. When we talk about some moments now, they'll, it'll just give you tingles because they're so special to us, and it's great to be able to capture them in a book. And and you got to remember too, a lot of people, like anyone who's sort of 25, 26, wouldn't really remember Kathy Freeman's run in 2000. So to have that in there and, and capture that and, and everything that went on around that for people who didn't live through that moment to get to experience it. Hopefully, through reading it, they, they get a feel for it. I, I think that's pretty special. I was a bit surprised, though. In your top 20, you didn't have the cats been beating uh, the swans by so much this year, your beloved cats. <laughs> that was, you know what? Uh, I gave Koshi a book, and I had to give one to him because he doesn't buy anything. First thing he went did was he scanned through to find if I'd written anything about Geelong, and he was a bit disappointed that I hadn't. But much as that they are the mighty cats, so they, they didn't make the list. The, the AFL moment that was the big one for me was the Brisbane Lions, who came from really rock bottom to win three premierships in a row under Lee Matthews and, you know, what they achieved was was pretty special. So that, that's certainly there. Well, a few of my moments, and obviously, uh, like you've spoken about, there's just been so many. We'll start with mm. one of my favourites, and that was last year, Paddy Mills, 42 points, taking the Aussies yeah. to their first ever men's bronze medal at an Olympic Games. What an incredible moment that was. Uh, tell us about that one, Barretts, and, and what made you love that one so much? I think over history, I've, I've been at so many years, starting with Atlanta in 96, where Australia has not been able to get a medal in men's basketball. And we know we've had a good quality team, but it, it's just such a such a competitive sport in in the men's field and you know we've we've probably deserved one at times and we've been unlucky and you know other times we've got close and to see Paddy Mills not just get the medal but the way he got it and the way he built that team and the culture he put in that team and the amount of himself that he invested in that team yeah that was just a great story you know right down to you know, travelling to to games, you know, they'd be cranking up the Aussie tunes. They only ever, when they were together, they only ever played Aussie music on the bus and that could have been Slim Dusty's, um, you know, I'd love to have a beer with Duncan or it could have been Down Under Men at Work or In Excess or whatever. But, you know, they just built this culture in that team. And someone said to me the other day, hey, but hang on, it's only a bronze medal. And I just said, wow, it's an Olympic medal. And it was, it was all that we've ever wanted in men's basketball. And, I mean, you you only have to look at the reaction from Andrew Gaze at the time, a, yes. a bloke who's put his heart and soul and life into that team, um, to see his reaction when they got that medal that we've been trying for decades and decades, well, forever, to try and win. So that that for me was a, a magic moment. And, and to talk to Paddy, I just find him, you know, he, he's on my my top five list of Australian sports people to talk to because he's, he's just insightful and, and beautiful and wonderful. You know, he's just a, a great human and he sees far beyond his sport and he understands what he can do beyond his sport. You know, I think I, I rank him, you know, right up there with Ash Barty, you know, they, those two are just for me pretty exceptional people and we're really lucky to have them as Australians. Yeah, well said. I haven't heard anyone say a bad word about Paddy Mills and and I totally agree with you. I saw Gazy tearing up as well and I thought there's a beautiful moment <laughs> when when Paddy, and it's again, it just shows the sort of person that he is. He goes, it's not just about mm. us, it's about all these all these players over the years that have represented the Boomers yeah. and I thought that was absolutely magnificent, Brett. Yeah, and remember, he they they started they they handed out the the hats, you know, they had a, a, an Australian icon symbol for each of the players, and they you know they numbered and they went back and they they bought the all those players, all the history, the the veterans of men's basketball, all into and connected into that group, which was was just amazing, you know. And that's that's the magic of Paddy. But yeah, that was it, it was it was a, I think it was a special moment. And again, it, it meant so much to the nation. You know, it was the tail end of the Tokyo Games. We had a great Olympic Games. The way people reacted to that was was fantastic. Speaking of magical moments, the next one takes us back to 2002, Salt Lake City, Winter Olympics. Steve Bradbury, a lot of people have said nowadays uh, there's the Bradbury, doing a Bradbury. Every time I watch this, I absolutely get goosebumps and I know it's been played over and over again over the years. What an amazing moment, though, for Australian Winter Olympic sport. Unbelievable. Our first Winter Olympic gold medal and and what a way to do it. You know, and, and I think just it became part of our culture, you know, like you say, doing the Bradbury. What I tried to do with each of these stories is just dig a little bit deeper. So I've gone back to tell the story of 
of what happened that night because we happened to be, I, I was talking to Pat Welsh, my seven colleague, about it the other day because we were both uh, we were both getting ready for the next day, which was Elisa Campbell. And, you know, she was going for gold medal and she won a gold medal in freestyle aerials. But then out of the blue, we, we got this call, Steve Bradbury's won a gold medal. And we scrambled to get there and then we, we caught up with him um, at, at the last lap, which was the Australian venue in Salt Lake City. And the celebrations in there, they they tried to close the bar because obviously Salt Lake City closes down pretty early and, and there are strict alcohol rules. They tried to shut down the Australian party and um, Rob Woodhouse, who was was managing at the time, Woody yeah. suddenly slapped 25 cases of Budweiser on the bar and the party <laughs> rolled on because once you bought the beer, they couldn't kick you out. So <laughs> it, was, it was a great celebration. And, you know, Steve Bradbury had a, had a magic night. I think it was, a, it was just a fairy tale for him. You know, it was just a such a special thing. You know, I think anyone who was, who was around that time it was just um, – it was incredible, and it, it and it just showed. I think it just showed everyone in sport and, and kids as well that um, you never give up. You know, you're never out of the race. You you keep going and you do your best, and you don't know how it'll pan out. You know, all those kids learn to sort of to keep running right to the beyond the finish line. You know, that was that's what the Bradbury moment is all about. And and the other one, I mean, there's just so many as you, as we spoke about earlier that we could go on and on about. But Ash Barty being another one that was certainly one of my favourites, winning Wimbledon. But the next one. <laughs> John Aloisi back in 2005, <laughs> unbelievable, uh, that penalty yeah. shootout winner to take Australia through to the World Cup where he obviously mm. did that against Uruguay in Sydney. Here's that amazing moment. That means that if John Aloisi can score this goal, Australia will be there. Are you sure? I'm trying to do my math, I can John. Here's Aloisi for a place in the he World Cup. For us. He yeah! scored! Australia have got it! John! Come on! John Aloisi, the Confederations on, Cup hero, has done it on, boys. in the biggest game of all. Come on, Australia! Johnny Warren! At last! At long, at long last! Now, I don't know about you, Barrett, so I think I was getting ready to play mixed basketball that night, so I think everyone remembers where they were back in 2005. Yeah. Um, where were you when that amazing moment happened? I was in the stadium, and um, why that, that memory and that night stands out to me is I have never hugged so many people in the one <laughs> night. Um, the, the stadium went nuts because the, the build-up was just, it was it was explosive. It was, it was about to go off that stadium because we'd been taken right to the edge to the very last chance to, to make the World Cup. And, you know, it had been so long and the, the build-up was incredible. Like, it really felt like we were sitting on a powder keg. And, and when it was done, it was the explosion of emotion. I don't think I've ever seen a crowd in this country or anywhere in the world react like that. It was unbelievable. People hugged each other uh, for probably an hour after the game. You know, just no one moved. It was just an amazing moment and a great celebration. And I think you know, having the game here on home soil, obviously the crowd was was mostly Australian. So that, you know, that made it even bigger and, and more impressive. But um, yeah, that, that was a golden moment for sure. Now, obviously, number one, we, we can't give too much away because you have to go out and buy the book. But uh, any hints for us there, Barretts? <laughs> Oh, I reckon she's pretty special, this one. <laughs> and, uh, you know, what's interesting, uh, the people who, who picked up the book, I, I've not seen anyone, and I know everyone will have their own view of the list, we talked about that, but no one objects to this one. You know, no one says that this, this moment doesn't belong as the number one moment since 2000. So well, I think it, it becomes fairly obvious to people, but it was, it was just magic. And, you know, to, even writing about it, to go back and, and relive it and, you know, all that was happening around that time, you know, everything that, that was involved in, in that person getting that job done was, was phenomenal. <laughs> and now I mentioned at the start of this, uh, this chat that over 30 years now, it's phenomenal, you've been in the media. So in the 1990s, you, mm. you, you first began. Um, tell us about the, yeah. early, the early days, uh, what it was like and how you first got your break into the media, Barretts. It was great. Um, I was I was at uni at the time, but all I ever wanted to do was, uh, you know, never get out of sport. And I'd, I'd had some time water skiing and had a great time doing that. 
and I, I just I just loved sport. I didn't didn't want to leave the world of sport. So I, I you know, sports journalism was the, the thing I, I wanted to do. So I started commentating basketball. I'd been doing courtside announcing for the Geelong Supercats and then the North Melbourne Giants, which led me to do some work with Channel 10. And I, at the same time I'd been working in radio, I started my local station at 3GL that then became K-Rock Geelong um, that was bought by the Hoyts Network. So I ended up doing stuff for Triple M in Melbourne. And, and that's where I bumped into Eddie McGuire and, and Eddie eventually took me into Channel 10 in Melbourne, got me going there. And I, my job with Triple M would be to fill in for Eddie. So whenever Eddie was away, I'd, I'd step in for him and I'd do weekend sport as well. And then uh, Drew Morford, uh, who's a great AFL commentator, uh, retired from seven. I was offered that job at seven and my interview was with the producer at the time, a lovely bloke called Bill Cannon. And Billy interviewed me over a cigarette in the car park. You know, that's how things were in those, those days. And said, you know, oh, you, you, you got the job. So, um, you know, it was like start on Monday. So it was, and, and just after that, um, within that same week, I, I'd signed up and started. And Seven announced that they'd got the Olympic Games. They'd signed the contract from Atlanta in 96, summer and winter games through to Beijing in 2008. And I guess we're... I'm in the right place. <laughs> so, but I'd always had that. I'd always had the dream of going to Olympic Games. I always thought, you know, wow, you know, that, that's the ultimate to get to an Olympics. And you know, luckily, by, by this, um, some miracle, I've, I've now been to 13 Summer and Winter Olympic Games, which I, I treasure the memories from those. That, that's the most special thing. And hopefully, I've got one or two left in me as well. <laughs> well, I haven't been to one yet, so you're, you're certainly ahead of me there. I hope I'll get to one one day. But um, yeah, you got to go. They're, they're absolutely. Awesome. It's, on, it's on the bucket list, definitely. Tell <laughs> us about you know those 13 you've been to. There's obviously been so many memorable moments, uh, but tell us a couple of the, the favourite ones over the time. Yeah, well, at, uh, probably Atlanta 96, your first one is, is always blows your mind, you know, and, and as a young reporter, I was I was able to, to get out to everything. I, I was lucky enough to be there in that stadium and covering the night that Kathy Freeman got the silver medal in the 400 metres in Atlanta. And I was there when she went back and spoke to her mum, and would you believe she said to her mum, you know, mum, I hope you're not disappointed, but I'll, I'll get the gold in Sydney. And we just went, whoa, you know, amazing moment. And then just to follow that through and, you know, see the end result four years later was incredible. Yeah, a lot of great moments from Atlanta. Probably for me, one of my, I mean, Sydney 2000 was was amazing um, by by stroke of luck. I ended up hosting the the nighttime part of the telecast. So I, I worked that night that, that Kathy ran in 2000, the 25th of September. And that, that was a, still one of the most watched nights ever in Australian television. So that was just an honour to be part of that. And then for me, Alyssa Camplin's uh, gold medal in uh, in Salt Lake City in freestyle aerials, I got to commentate that. So, you know, that was pretty special to see an Australian. Oh, when Australians win in sports where we're just not, they just don't seem natural to us, that's amazing for me. You know, to see her get that gold medal in Salt Lake City was like, wow, you know, that, that's pretty awesome. And to get to commentate it with the great Stephen Lee, our, our great Winter Olympian, you know, that was that was pretty special. But I think every game you've got so many, so many incredible moments. And I, when I first got to go, we have a conference where the commentators were all briefed. And I sat next to Sandy Roberts in the first one before Atlanta and I said, Sandy, what is this thing like? You know, what, what can I expect? And he said, it is like two AFL grand finals every day for two weeks. Oh. And, said, wow. <laughs> and that's probably the most accurate description of an Olympic Games because it's just, it's just happening all the time for two weeks. That's a great way of looking at it. I love that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Sandy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Another legend of Australian sport, that's for sure, from the broadcasting side of things. Uh, now, Brett, so I wanted to ask you about your water skiing. Ten times you're an Australian water <laughs> ski champion. You, you're so modest, so that's why you're laughing. But um, explain, yeah. the, explain the journey, how you first got into water skiing and were there any other sports that you dabbled in as a young fella as well? Well, AFL, I played AFL growing up in Geelong. It was a natural thing to do. My, my dad was actually not a bad player. So, um, you know, it was, it was natural for me to play AFL. I was actually not that talented on the footy field at all. And uh, I dabbled in, in hockey for a while. I played a bit of hockey, but skiing became my thing. My, my mum and dad loved water skiing. They had an old boat. They would ski year round in Geelong on the Barwon River, which is an amazing achievement because it's, it's cold in winter. <laughs> But Dad taught me to ski when I was four years old and I actually couldn't swim and he was tossing me into the river and he decided that the best thing to do would be to actually use two life jackets just in case. <laughs> so he tied one on the front and one on the back and I, so I bobbed around, as Dennis would say, like a cork in the ocean. And um, so I didn't really have an option but to ski. It was either it was classic ski or, or sink. So, yeah, so I, I started doing that and, and just 
progressed through, loved it, had a great time, won some national events, which was great. We had a good run, had a couple of good runs overseas, uh, was a runner up in an international event in, in Singapore. I, had a rec- I kept a hold of a record in the US for a little while and uh, my greatest claim to fame was probably teaching a Libby Newton-John to water ski. So that was um, oh, wow. back in the, what was that, 84? Yeah, so that was that was pretty cool. I got to do that in the US. So that was my 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 greatest moment probably in skiing. Through skiing, I got into commentary. I used to, when I became a an old broken down skier, I started commentating and that probably led me into Moomba Masters and into Seven and, and to where I am today. And what was Olivia like as a skier? <laughs> really good, really good. Um, it's so impressive, such a lovely lady, but a, a beautiful skier. At that time, she just started seeing Matt Latanzi, and he was just a natural athlete. And what we do is that they'd come and they'd book this place where I was working as an instructor. They'd book it for a week, and they'd have a whole bunch of Aussie mates and a few American mates. And at the end of the week, we had a um, Olivia and I and a couple of other Aussies teamed up for Australia versus USA against the other instructors and, and Matt Latanzi and a couple of American mates. And I'm proud to say that Olivia and I and the Australian team kicked their butts. Oh, good work. <laughs> <laughs> and you still, do you still want to ski these days as well? Yeah, I love it. I, had, I, had a, I actually had a bad accident about two years ago trying to relive the past, and oh, um, no. as old athletes sometimes do. <laughs> um, and I, I pulled my in my left knee, I pulled the quad muscle off the bone and, and had to have that. It took about 12 months to get back over that. And I'm, I'm a bit tentative now, but I'm, it's fixed and I'm, I'm ready to go again. So I'm looking forward to this summer getting back on the water. And you've got a couple of young kids as well. Do you sort of teach them how to water ski too? Yeah, I, I, and uh, yeah, so Ava's 18 and Dan's 15 and a beautiful moment, um, Ava said to me during winter, she said, Dad, I really, really want you to take us um, skiing this summer. And I was like, yes, great. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and my wife, Rach, she is, is a natural, beautiful skier as well. So, you know, there's nothing better. I, it's, look, skiing is a great sport from a, from a family point of view because you've got to do it with other people around and to do it with your family is, is really magic. And I think that... In, in in my case growing up, that kept our family close together. And I've seen it work for a lot of other families as well. You know, you're out there on, on the river or on the lake or out in the, you know, in the bay together. Um, and it's just good family time. And it's, it's a great sport. You know, you're out in the sun and the water and it's healthy. And, you know, you're up on the river on the Murray, which is one of my favourite spots. And yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I love it. And I, I always will. It's in my blood. And something else that you love is your cycling. And last year, yeah. absolutely well-deserved. You you got a medal for the Order of Australia for all your work mm. you've done with Tour de Cure. What did this yeah. mean to you, Barretts, and, and why is the cause you know, so special to your heart as well? Um, it's probably, of all the things I've done, it, Tour de Cure is my, my proudest achievement. I, I think I, I feel best about that. And you know, it makes me sleep well at night. Um, I joined Tour de Cure, what, 15 years ago. And I'd seen them, they'd finished their first ride, they finished it at Martin Place on Sunrise. And it just something about it just struck a chord with me. I thought this is a, a, a great charity and, and a great event. And my brother Paul had just bought a bike shop, so I bought a bike off him at full retail, and I think maybe a bit more. But <laughs> getting involved in cycling was was a great thing. I was probably just at that stage of life too, where, you know, from skiing, my knees were a bit sore, and rather than running, cycling was a great thing. So I, I took this ride on. First one we did was from Sydney to uh, Maroochydore on the Sunshine Coast. It was just over 1,500 kilometres in 10 days. And it almost killed me. It actually, honestly, almost killed me. But I I loved it and I got the bug. And this will be actually my 14th ride this year. And we're going from Coffs Harbour to um, Noosa. And in that time, Tour de Cure has raised $80 million for cancer research. Wow. Uh, We've funded something like almost 600 Australian research projects and our researchers are some of the best in the world, so that's just awesome. Um, but the, the money is great, but it's what you do with that money that's really important. And we have led to 80 major international medical breakthroughs in cancer research. So one breakthrough would be awesome, but to have 80 is incredible. And what that means is that that charts the course of research. So once a, a researcher has a breakthrough to work with, that, that becomes a concrete brick, you know, that's a foundation. And they can work from there and say, okay, well, now I've got that factual information, I can go here and try this, or, or, or I'm not going to go down that path, but that's not going to work. It's quite amazing and it's hugely satisfying. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll line up for another one in March next year and fingers crossed get through that okay and, <laughs> and see how we go. Well, it's absolutely well-deserved, as I mentioned before, on getting that uh, medal for the Order of Australia, what you've done 
you've just spoken about it. That's just astronom astronomical amount of money to raise and, and yeah, keep up the great work, not only yourself, but everyone involved in that, Barrett's. Thanks, man. No, we, we love it. And, and, and I invite people all the time. I, you know, if anyone's got an interest in cycling or got a connection to cancer. And, and when I when I started this, we didn't have um, any cancer in the family, you know, which was which was amazing. But um, my mum has um, ovarian cancer and uh, she's had an operation and a fair bit of chemo and she's back in chemo at the moment and she's doing an amazing job but um you know it's a it's a ruthless disease it's, it's relentless it taught me that this you know it's it's random you don't know if it's going to strike you or your family or your friends and uh you know when it does it, it, it's brutal it's it's only made my resolve more steely to do something and, and help find cures and the good news is we're finding better treatments and cures all the time so you know i really feel our, our work is so important yeah, well said. And um, yeah, best wishes with your mum. Hopefully she pulls her okay as well. Thanks, no, Thanks, my, my pleasure. Now, once again, the book is called Mark Beretta's Greatest Moments in Australian Sport. Absolute beauty. I recommend uh, going out and getting yourself a copy. Yeah. <laughs> and where can they buy this great this great book, Brett's? All, all around Australia. Great bookstores, bad bookstores, whatever you like. Um, or you can order it online. I think Booktopia, all those places. Uh, someone someone messaged me the other day. They bought it in the airport and started reading it on the plane. So it's out and about. You'll find it. Um, and I, I just hope people love it and chat about the stories and you know relive some of the great memories we've had in this country. Well, your mate Sam, Sam Mack might not be too happy about it because it might knock off his accidental weatherman book as well. <laughs> I'll, I'll take that as a great achievement if that happens. <laughs> and uh, any any other books uh, in the future as well? What about a what about a twenty twenty moments of Olympic sports? Seeing you've been to thirteen Olympics. <laughs> yeah, that, that, yeah. To be honest, I hadn't really thought beyond this one, and I've, I've got no plans. But. And the other one I like is is, is great the twenty greatest commentary calls, you know, because they've Ooh. had some great commentary over the years, and and people like to relive those commentary calls as well. So maybe there's something there, but yeah, maybe Olympic moments because they're easy to film twenty amazing Olympic moments, and you'd probably need a hundred of them. So exactly, yeah, yeah anything's <laughs> possible, but not not for now, Bevo. Let's just um, put your best in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, anytime you want to come on for a chat, mate, you're always welcome, and and love promoting <laughs> great books like this, and and it's not. Absolute pleasure to have you on the show today, Mark Beretta. Thanks so much. We could have chatted all day. Um, keep up the wonderful work with, with Channel 7 and everything you're doing to, with Tour de Cure, the books, the list goes on. Uh, yeah, mate, thanks so much. I oh, appreciate it, Bebo. Thanks for your support and, and all the best. We'll talk soon, mate. Thank you. Look forward to it.